Please stand with me as we read God's Word. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 9, verse 33. And what I would like to read this morning is verse 33, 34, and 35. After, verse 33. After the demon was cast out of the mute, man spoke, and the crowds were amazed and were saying, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees were saying, He casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, speaking, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. You may be seated. Let me pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. As we meet in this place, we desire you. We want to desire you even more, even more today than we did yesterday. Oftentimes we battle with the flesh and the flesh wins. We have congregated because this is a place where we need to be. This is a place that you have established us to, to be in this morning. We desire your spirit to speak to us. We thank you for reminding us that today is a day of Pentecost. You, your tender Holy Spirit will teach us this morning. Your Holy Spirit will remind us. And your Holy Spirit will, will convict <coughs> us of our wrongdoing. Lord, thank you for this place. Thank you for drawing us together so our souls could be fed from your, your word. Speak. Speak through this weak vessel, this emotional servant this morning, as he represents you. Help him not to misrepresent you, but help him to represent you. Lord, again, we thank you so much this morning, and we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the tender Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. We stopped at verse 33 in our previous Sunday, and I'm glad that you're listening. Somebody approached me and said, hey, you're not done. You're, you're not done. And he was correct. He was correct. Uh, I told Paul that I will take care of that verse here this morning. But here we are in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9. We stopped at the first part of 9.33, the healing of the deaf and the mute guys. If you know anything about your Bible, you know that there are two kinds of people. There are two kinds of camps in the Bible. Those who are blessed and those who are cursed. Those who are humble and those who are proud. Those who are saved and then those who are unsaved. Jesus is making a dividing line in Matthew's Gospel. And I believe this is a dividing line that started all the way back in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7. And some of you were with us. And I have preached through uh, Matthew's Gospel, the Sermon on the Mount from, verse, from chapter 5 to 7, one of the most powerful, one of the most powerful sermons ever preached. And in Matthew's Gospel, there's a, a narrow gate. And the gate is, and there's a narrow gate, and the gate is wide. There's one that, that's wide and, and broad that leads to destruction. The narrow gate is those who walk through are blessed. The, the broad gate or the broad, the broad way in, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, verses 13 and 18. 
is a way that leads to destruction. The sad thing is, and the, the most tragic thing is that many, many who enter through it will be destroyed. Few will make a plea for salvation. Even today, only a few people will make will have a profession of faith when it when it comes to the things of God. A profession of faith. Recently I heard a, a story of, of Jonathan Edwards, and you know who Jonathan Edwards was. He was a, a man who lived in the 1700s. Death came to him when he was 54, but he got kicked out of his church. And the reason why he got kicked out of his church is because he was challenging the, congrega the congregants. He was challenging the children to abstain from communion until they could profess why they believe in Christ, their profession of faith. It had to be based on, based on the Word of God. They could talk about their godliness and all the, the good works they've done, but the profession of faith, what were they placing it in? So Jonathan Edwards made a, made a letter, made a statement to the people, no one can have communion unless they give their profession of faith. Well, the people in the audience were a little bit upset about that. And so they asked Mr. Edwards to leave the congregation. Interesting that after he left for 15 months, he still preached there. He, he uh, stayed in the parsonage, and, and they couldn't find a preacher until a year, almost a year and a half, before he was replaced. There's another example in the Bible about, about the dividing line that Christ makes in the sand. He, he gives the, the illustration, you remember it, about a man who builds his house, and the man who builds his house on rock and sand. There are only two kinds of houses that can be built, one on rock or, or one on sand. And Scripture tells us that if you build your house on sand, the house will collapse. It will collapse. But if you build it on a rock, it's surely going to stand forever. Most people try to hold on to their life, and then they lose it. And then there are those who lose their life. And, it, and so losing their life, they find it. Two kinds of people. They're building their house on a, a rock or a sand. All of Jesus' preaching, we see that he offers himself as a divining line in the sand, and he challenges his people to, to make their choice to choose. And in Matthew chapter 10, we're not there yet. When we get to chapter 10, the verse says, 32 says, Whoever shall confess me before men, whoever confesses me before men, do you confess Christ before men? Or do you deny him? Or do you deny him? This is the, 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 the big idea, the, the evidence of the Gospels. A dividing mark in the sand is a dividing line. Where do you stand this very moment with Christ? Are you with Christ or are you against Christ? Do you love God or you're not sure you love God? Where do you stand this very moment with Christ? The Apostle Paul, you know, in the Apostle Paul in his letters, he makes that point. He makes that point quite often that the human race is divided in, in two camps, believers and unbelievers. Heaven-bound people and hell-bounded people. Blessed people and cursed people. Shouldn't we touch the world with the fragrance of God? We are living in some extraordinary times, some unique times, and, and I pray that the believers would seize the moment and not speak more of the coronavirus, but speak more of Christ and, and Him crucified in our lives. I'd like you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I want you to look to verse 14, 15, and 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14, 15, and 16. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma, the knowledge of him in every place. 
Why can't the believer be a sweet aroma everywhere he goes? The fragrance of Christ, the dividing line. Look at verse 15, verse 15. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are, are perishing. I was asked the question this past week, Dan, do you preach about the Christian God? The Christian God. And of course, off the cuff, I would say absolutely, but I know where the question was coming from. Ladies and gentlemen, has the American Christian really make an impression? Has he really been an aroma and a fragrance for the, un, for the unbeliever? Do people want us near them or do, we, or do they repel against us because of what we stand for? And there are some hobby horses that the Christian community will, will die on. We shouldn't worry about winning an argument. We should be more concerned about winning a friend. Because you could always bring the gospel to a friend. Your enemy will never listen to you again. Look at verse 16, uh, same chapter. To the one, an aroma from death to death. And to the other, an aroma of life to life. And those who uh, adequate for these things. One of the sad things that's going on in our, our nation today, one of the sad things that, that breaks my heart and, 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 and what God has called us to do, pastors, teachers, ministers, even you, that when somebody slips into eternity, the funeral is limited. Here's a time where we want to embrace the grieving family. And in the Latino culture, touching is so pivotal, so important, but you can't do that. Death to death, life to life. We're limited. We're limited. But the believer should seize the moment and one of the things that have have not has not we have not been hindered from reading god's word and going deeper with the things of god we should go more deeper in the things of god so paul is saying to those who are christians who live and preach the gospel are showing the gospel in their lives jesus divides it's quite clear as we look at chapter 8 and 9. Matthew wants to show us who Christ is and that a decision has to be made in our life. Matthew is saying, choose right. Matthew is saying, choose life. Matthew is saying, choose righteousness. Matthew is saying, choose godliness. And to choose is to believe. Matthew is helping us to consider the claims of Christ. He's helping us to see that. Matthew wants us to see that in its setting here. Matthew presents chapter 8. He presents chapter 9. The evidence that Christ is the Son of God and He's the Messiah. This is a narrow way, and I keep reminding us, this is a narrow way, and we must enter that way. This is the way of life in Christ and Him crucified. Many people are praying for, for a revival to hit the church, to come into the church as a result of what's been taking place in our nation. My heart sank. It sank in the last few days. And the ones I could think about, more than anyone else for the pastors in Minneapolis. The pastors in Minneapolis. My heart sank for them and I prayed for them. Are you convinced who Christ, who Christ claims to be? Here we saw several miracles tucked away in, in, in Matthew's gospel as Christ's journeys. 
Can you wrap your mind around those miracles? I mean, have you, have you, have you, has it so thin that these miracles were made by the Lord Jesus Christ? Can you imagine, and I put here in my notes, the mega, huge, breathtaking miracles that we were able to see? We only saw a glimpse. John's Gospel reminds us in chapter 20, verse 30, and many other signs truly did Jesus do in the presence of his disciples were not written in the book. Were not written. In verse 20, 21, chapter 20, verse 25, if we should be written, chapter John 21, 25, if they should be written, I suppose that even the world itself could contain, not contain, what was written in Jesus' life. Jesus records nine miracles and he divides them in three sections. And after each section, it responds, it responds with a miracle. As we look at Matthew chapter 9, let me remind all of us there's a response of those people who are watching Christ. Let me refresh your memory. In Matthew chapter 9, we, we, we saw the conversion of Matthew. He responds. He's converted. The Pharisees are irritated by Jesus. They really are. I'm going to see that the irritation comes to, to almost name-calling in just a second. But not only do we see Matthew, not only do we see these Pharisees, these religious Jews, we also see the confusion of the disciples of John the Baptizer. They're confused. Everyone gives a response. Jesus leaves an impression on everyone. Either we love Christ or we don't love Christ. Either we love God or we don't love God. Some, res some respond, and the Bible says some believe. In fact, we read also that they marveled and they were astonished. They were in shock. They were in awe. And, and people's astonishment with the, with the power of God on what Jesus did. Let me ask you this morning. Are you still in nod when you read the scriptures? Do you open the Bible and look and let the Spirit speak to you? Are you, are you in awe? Do you allow Him, do you allow him to, to grab a hold of your heart in, in, in awe? You say, ah, God has spoken. God speaks to us every single day. Every single day. People were astonished by the power of God and all that Jesus did. But when Jesus starts talking to people about their sin, just like you and I, when you start talking to people about their sin and what's keeping them from God, they go deaf. They don't want to hear. I was reminded that in chapter 7 of Matthew, Jesus speaks with authority. The crowds were amazed. Chapter 7, verse 28. They were amazed with Jesus' sermon. And also in chapter 7, we read that he taught as one with, with great authority, not like the, the Jewish leaders. He, he taught with authority. There's something different about, something different about Christ. The first miracle we saw in our journey uh, through Matthew's gospel that he healed a leper. He also healed a centurion servant from paralysis. And he healed Peter's mother-in-law. He goes on and calms the storm, the, the physical disorder he brings to calmness. And, and, and he deals with the casting out a, a legion of, of demons when he puts them in the pigs and they go over the hill. Moral disorder by healing the paraplegic and, and, and gives him the forgiveness of sin. And then he doubts with death and gives back speech to a deaf man, a mute man. And then he, he gives eyes, he gives sight to a, a man that's blind. And the raising of Jairus' daughter 
from the dead. These are huge, mega miracles that Christ performs. And we see the demonstration of, of Christ's power. Notice that each miracle leaves an impression on the audience. Every time we open the Word of God and we read it and we reply, apply it to our soul, it must leave an impression on us. We should, we should no longer be the same. I thought of the many, myri the myriads of sermons I have heard, the many Bible studies that I, that have I sat in and also taught. I, I asked myself, which ones stick out in your mind? And they all should stick out in their mind. Because the, it's the divine word of God. Hmm. But right now, what I, I'd like to do is examine from verses 33 to 35 this morning. Look with me to verse 34 as we begin our time together. But the Pharisees are saying, he casts out demons. He casts out demons by the ruler of the demons. The Pharisees were very suspicious. They were very envious of Jesus. They came to the conclusion that Jesus was an enemy of Judaism. He was an enemy of Judaism and, and, and they were in charge of Judaism. And in their minds, the enemy of their religion was an enemy of God. Could they deny the miracles that Jesus had performed? In fact, it was prophesied that Jesus would do these miracles. They chose to deny the, the source of the miracles. They refused to recognize Jesus as the Messiah of God. They declared him to be an agent of Satan who cast out the demons by the ruler of the demons. Hmm. They criticized the one who made them. Now I want you to go up to two chapters toward the back of your Bible to Matthew chapter 12. Please look with me to Matthew chapter 12 as a cross-reference verse. And when I get to 12 in the year 2023, <laughs> we, will, we will expound a little bit more of this, of this verse. But I want you to move your eyes to Matthew chapter 5, excuse me, 20, chapter 12, verse 24. And when the Pharisees heard this, Matthew 12, 24, they said, this man casts out demons by Beelzebub and the ruler of the demons. You know, the darkness and the hardness and the angers that was in the Pharisees' heart led them to attack Jesus foolishly. And charge, and charge that they, they hoped the people would leave that charge and that their blindness would go further to keep, them, uh, keep others from believing Christ. And they were determined in their unbelief and their blindness to stay stuck where they're at. They probably would not be convinced of Christ ever. When an unbeliever sets his mind not to believe, he is set not to believe. You can bring the facts, you can try to reason with someone, and he's, and he's built that inside not to believe the oracles of truth, not to believe Christ. They're convinced nothing will enlighten them. The unbeliever wants to say in darkness, he refuses to recognize the light. Christ is the light. He refuses to accept the facts and refuses to believe Christ. There are people like that in your family and my family. There are people like that on your block and my block. There are people in, in, in that we know who will never be converted. Hopefully, they will come to the conclusion to be converted, but they don't. They reject the facts and don't believe it. And ladies and, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, the line is crossed in the sand. They will be damned. Sad. It's a tragedy. So, Dan, are you saying we don't pray for them? Absolutely not. Continue to pray for them. 
Any response to Jesus, to Jesus, of faith, they would not do. They rejected all that Christ said, and the results of that, these religious men who were supposed to have known about God, known about the Messiah, they were dead. We all, we all need to respond to the impression that Jesus leaves in our leaves in our lives. Every time we look at his word, every time we hear him, there's an impression that God leaves on us. I like with the the uh, quote of the week. I'm going to ask Tim to place that on the, the screen, the quote of the week. And I want, to, I want to read it this morning. Here's what he says. Thankfulness flows out of a heart that's rooted in Christ. Where is your heart rooted this morning? Is it rooted on the earth? Is it rooted in the things that you can hold on? Is it ro rooted in the illusion that you're always going to be healthy, that you're always going to be alive? Thankfulness flows out of the heart that is rooted in Christ. If Christ is the Lord of our lives, we will live for Him, be built on Him, and be strengthened in Him. Ultimately, we find ourselves overflowing with the thankfulness to Him for all that He has said on our behalf. I got a text this past week from an individual, and he was showing me his, his bounty. His bounty. He was lavishing in what he had. And I have to reply to those of us, we must reply, we have to reply because people send you a text, they want to reply, don't they? <laughs> and, and you can't just do a thumbs up, you can't just do a, a smiling face, you, you can't just do a okay or and God forbid us <laughs> to say I'm envious and, and send that green thing to them. <laughs> I could think of just a, a short reply. And I I sent it. I had no reservations. I thought it through for five <laughs> seconds. Those are not always good thoughts. Five <laughs> seconds. But I all I could say is God had been extremely good to us. Amen. Extremely good to us. God has been extremely good to us. The thankfulness that flows around our heart must be rooted in Christ. There's a line in the sand must require us to do something. We have to respond they're either we're with God or we're not with God. Either we're going to follow Him or not follow Him. Either we're going to trust Him or not trust Him. Either way, God has been extremely good to us. Amen. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus went all about teaching. He taught in synagogues and He preached the gospel. Of the kingdom of God. And the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 4, healing all manner of sickness, all the manner of diseases among the people. Here we are. That was Matthew 4. And if you have a, a fast forward button, we fast forward all the way to Matthew chapter 9. Chapter 9. And we see all these miracles had taken place. The important, the most important of the Galilean ministry went out. Jesus goes out constantly. And he's constantly doing what he's supposed to do. The Bible says that he went out to cities and he went out to villages. 
It went out to cities and villages in, in Galilee. And the historian Josephus tells us that Jesus must have went to over 204 towns and villages. And you're asking this very question as I ask this question. What is the difference between a silly city and a village? Does anybody know? What is the difference? The Bible said he went to villages. The Bible said he went to cities. And the difference between a city and a village is this, that a city has a wall. You didn't have a wall. You had a village or a city. And the city with a wall was fortified. And the area that Christ preached constantly, and he went to these villages, and he went to these cities, he was moving quite rapidly. And the area that he traveled was 70 miles by 40 miles. And Joe Cephas recorded that these miles, excuse me, these cities were, were numerous. And the multitude of villages were, 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 were crowded with men, working men, working the land from the smallest little, little village of 15,000 people to more. And one writer said that Jesus must have talked to over 3 million people. I had never heard of that. And you probably will question my, my source. But he moved from these little towns. And what did he do? The Bible says that he healed people. The Bible said that he was preaching. And the Bible said he was teaching. He focused on the teaching. And he had access to the synagogue where he preached and the kingdom of God, and he was healing everybody who came to him and everyone who was sick. Let's look at that word again. First teaching in the synagogues. As you know, the, your, your history of, of synagogues, they didn't come into an existence until 500, 500, 586 B.C. The synagogue was essential of the Jewish life and the Jewish community. The synagogue was a place of worship. It was also used as a townhouse and a courthouse. For those of you who lived in, in California, know that in the Brooklyn area of east of Los Angeles, you can find Jewish temples. One of the first churches that we were involved in was a Jewish temple. And then, became a, then it became a Catholic church, a, a, a form of the Catholic church, a ministry of the Catholic church. But, 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 but everywhere there were 10 men, there was a, a usually a synagogue. 10 families made up a synagogue. It was a place called, the synagogue means a place of assembly. Where at least 10 Jewish men lived, the synagogue would be, the families would be formed. And they were throughout cities and in and, and, and the ancient world. Numerous synagogues. And, and in those days, they did not use vehicles. They, had, they, used, they used to walk to the synagogue. One thing I find interesting, and maybe some of you already knew this, that when they built a synagogue, they didn't have any roofs. And so as they celebrated, they looked toward heaven and thought of God in heaven. Also, when they built these synagogues, they would, they would, they would put a, a pole in the synagogue. So, so someone coming to that particular city, they would see the pole and they would be attracted to the, they would be attracted, they would see the the pole, and that would bring them to the destination of the synagogue. Synagogues are usually built right near rivers or also on a hill. Synagogues, as I said earlier, was had a, a long pole, and, and kind of like today, what do, when people are driving up the street uh, on Cardinal, they look to the right and they see a, they see a, a steeple, thanks to of Francis the Slusher's son. There's a, a steeple. And when they see that steeple, they say, there's surely there's a, there's a church there. A lot of steeples have crosses. So when someone visited the town, they could see that. When, when they would come together, they would ce celebrate the feast, they would celebrate festivals, the, the holy days. They would come together to worship and and it was a, a structured time, a time of thanksgiving and a time of blessing. At the beginning, they would thank the Lord and, and, and voice that and praises to God. 
And they would give testimony. And you know what they would give testimonies about? They would give testimonies about the goodness of God. And they would read in Hebrew, and then someone would translate it to the, the common language of Aramaic. They would read the Bible. They would exposit the Bible, and they would talk about the prophets of old. This is the practice of reading, the practice of exposing the scriptures. And this goes all the way back to a guy in the Old Testament named Nehemiah. Preach, teach God's word. Let me ask you a personal thought. Whom are you teaching the word of God to? Whom are you preaching to on a regular basis? Jesus was speaking in the synagogue. You remember that story? Jesus was preaching in the synagogue once. We see that in Isaiah. He, he quotes Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. Jesus explains himself to fulfill the fulfillment and the true interpretation of Isaiah 61. You remember that? And in Luke chapter 4, the Spirit is upon me, Christ says. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring goodness to the afflicted. He has sent me, he has sent me to, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. Freedom. Freedom for the prisoners. As I looked at I, as I looked at Matthew, Christ, as he traveled in these villages and he traveled in these cities, he was a guest speaker. He was a guest speaker, and it was it was called the, the freedom of the synagogue. And they were giving qualified men to, to, to speak to the congregation. It was a privilege to, to have a visiting rabbi, and that's what Christ was, a, a rabbi, the, the privilege. And, 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 and I like, I like that, that Jesus and the Apostle Paul took advantage of that. Took advantage of that, of that open door where they would come and they would spread the gospel in the first century. Synagogues were also used as a public school or similar to a seminary. And the Jewish boys were, were trained in the Talmud. And the Talmud is the commentaries of the law of Moses. For many Jewish men besides the Alan, besides the rabbis, often spent their time studying the word of God in Acts chapter 17. Also, in the synagogues, all the religious disputes were settled in the synagogue. Look at verse 35. It was not only healing, not only teaching, but they were preaching as well. Proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. The basic meaning of the word preaching is to herald a message, to make a public announcement to everyone so that they will hear. Jesus taught in synagogues and he taught in the in the street corners, and he, and he taught on hillside, and he taught at, at sea shores. He proclaimed the gospel, calling his listeners to believe. To believe. And the word gospel means good news. Jesus teaching about the kingdom. And ladies and gentlemen, if your heart is filled with thankfulness, on our lives, on our lives and our lips should be the good news of the kingdom of God. Every Christian is a citizen of the kingdom of God in their life. Teaching and proclaiming the gospel. These are two most important primary ministries of the church today. That's why we still exist. And our first calling is to teach men. Our first calling is to teach men. Women. Our first calling is to teach children the truth of God's word. We see that in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 to 20. The last part of 935 is the healing. Jesus' ministry of teaching and preaching was verified by the divine, by, by as divine and true by the display of his supernatural power in the ministry. The ministries of 
of, of healing and the miracles that we see today. Let me ask you a question as we close our time together. What are you waiting for? How will you respond to the impression that Jesus has left on their lives? Have you responded yet of Christ? Let me pray. Lord, Jesus' life was so short, but he left an impression on many people. Hopefully, some will believe even today. We should never be the same after we hear and read about Christ our Savior. His life must challenge us to live for you. You are worth living for. We must live for you and not ourselves. Please, please forgive us when we try to be content with the trivial things of our life. Forgive us for the sins that keep us from loving you. Amen. Amen.